So welcome to this afternoon's DFI webinar. I'm really excited to have a special guest to join us today. Uh, we have Sandy Reader from Makuru joining us, and she's gonna to talk to us a little bit more about the journey that Makuru have been on from a sort of startup to now a more household name amongst certainly um, Southern African countries. Just as a reminder, today's session is being recorded. So if you do have an internet issue or you really enjoyed the session and want to share it with a colleague, you'll be receiving an email tomorrow with a link to the recording. And um, this is an open and interactive session. So at the end, after Sandy's finished her sharing the journey with us, we'll have a Q&A session. And if you want to ask Sandy any questions, please pop it in the Q&A function, which will pop up on the bottom menu of, of the Zoom menu if you move your mouse towards the bottom of the screen. So without any further ado, let me hand over to our guest speaker. Thank you so much for taking the time to share the journey with us, Sandy, and over to you. Great, thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Quite disconcerting, I can't see you all, but um, great to kind of be here and to be able to share our story. Uh, let me get this going. Okay, I'm hoping you can all see my screen. Sarah, can you confirm? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, this afternoon, uh, essentially, I wanted to kind of share the Makuri's journey from what was really not a, a Silicon Valley kind of beginning, but from quite a, quite a humble beginning and, and, and a little bit of an interesting and different journey to who we are today, which is a major African fintech player. Um, so I want to talk about it in terms of my role as CIO and in terms of Makuru's sort of being at heart a, a tech company as, as well as a customer service company. Just talk about that from, from a digital perspective and, and how has our digital journey really helped to drive um, the business strategy that we've been trying to achieve over the last, the last decade and more um, and sort of what, you know, how, how we got to the kind of scale we've got to along that tech journey. Um, our tech journey has really been about using digital platforms appropriately in an African context, more at the right times and for our customers correctly, you know, rather than, than some great sexy digital story, which I think um, a, lot of, a lot of companies have. Ours has kind of been a journey about meeting customers where they are and using technology to do that. And obviously, we'll talk a little bit about how levering technology into the future remains a really exciting challenge and the fuel to help drive business growth. So who is Makuru? Um, I'm certainly hopeful that Makuru is a household name in, in our market, but perhaps there are people on the call who don't know who we are. Um, so at the core, Makuru is, you know, why we exist is to really help people who have an absolute need. We're a remittances-led financial service provider, and our typical customer is a financially undisturbed migrant, um, and they have a real need to move and use money in a convenient way safe and affordable manner because this is personal um, people want to fulfill their desire to improve their own and their family's lives um, and we've been able to put down a product and some technology that can help them do that so we're an online remittances company and we give customers the opportunity to send money back home to their relatives um, or friends in a, in a cost effective way we allow that money to land as cash which is kind of the core of our dna and is very important in the african context um, but also electronically into wallets, bank accounts, et cetera. Um, and we've started to offer, well, for quite a while now, we've been offering subsidiary financial services to our clients who are otherwise quite excluded um, from the financial services market by virtue of the fact that they are foreign nationals. I'm going to show you a quick video of who Makuru is to help give you a sense, and then we'll jump straight into the Makuru journey. At Mukuru, we know that you work hard for your money. Week after week, month after month, you send home more than money. Working long and hard hours for their smiles. You send money home to make things better for more than just yourself, to build a brighter future for your family. Everything you do is to make them happy. At Mukuru, we know it's more than a money transfer for you. That's why we'll keep making it faster and easier to send money home your way. Thank you. Sure. 
Mukuru, more than money transfers. Okay, um, so essentially I want to talk to you guys today about how our check has changed over time to support the businesses. It has changed um, through our journey and to talk about the tech challenges that that has brought along the way for us and, and some of the things that we've had to, had to overcome. So to start off back in 2005, um, the founders of Mukuru are Zimbabwean and they were living in London at the time. And in 2005, you couldn't dial internationally in or out of Zimbabwe. Uh, started to get some kind of really interesting stuff going on in the economy there. Um, and the, the founders got involved with an online offering where you could register and, and get online. One of our founders has a background in IT development and he built up, and got a few coders involved to sort of build up a, a platform that would allow you to buy international talk time for your family in Zimbabwe. So you could buy a voucher and they would get texted back into Zim and that would allow you to actually speak to your family internationally. And given the, the Zim history, so many people sort of in the mid to late 2000s we're leaving Zimbabwe to kind of look for opportunities given, given the, 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 the quick decline of the economy um, in that particular era. By 2006, um, the offering had expanded a little bit. So they realized that there was a real need, you know, the, the diaspora in that, you know, in the UK in particular, were now watching their families back home really start to struggle, particularly with fuel and food. So the shortages at the, in Zimbabwe at the time, most particularly regarding kind of groceries, my, my family, my in-laws live in Zimbabwe. And so I can attest, you, you visited a, the equivalent of a pick and pay and the only thing on the shelves were, for example, cabbage and washing powder. So a, a crazy time. Um, and, and, you know, our founders sort of realized that there was an absolute need in this space. And so they started to expand the offering into fuel coupons. So you could buy dedicated fuel for your family um, to be collected at certain fuel stations, as well as groceries, um, food, meat, etc., cetera, um, to send back home to your family. And so the start of sort of a, a real offering um, came, came into being. It was all online. It only was operational from the UK. And the kind of technology that your recipient was having to deal with was just a text. So very low barriers to entry. Um, and, and the, the expansion, kind of the, the group expanded into a, a bit of a service contact center to support, to support things like that. So from a tech challenge, you know, building an online offering whilst building a business is always tricky. There's an investment spend there. You want to put something live, but you want to iterate on the service. So a lot of those kind of early days startup tech challenges, um, as well as as you grow, so does your legislative requirements grow. This is around exporting, moving money, or at least moving value cross borders. Um, and so dealing with the iterative service, the legislative framework, as well as kind of building on a shoestring uh, were some of, the, some of the interesting things that happened right, right at the beginning. Um, we actually have a, a little bit of a funny story around about this time. Um, our, our, one of our founders, the, the technical director, he was running a staging environment on one machine and the live environment on another with the service sort of under the desk. And uh, the staging environment's databases had to be cleared and wiped quite regularly and copies moved across. And he got distracted, he was called into a different meeting and he came back in and he sat down at the wrong machine and wiped the live database. And because it was such a new startup, there was no way to restore that. And so he had to manually rebuild the entire database from email messages that had been sent to customers for all of their registrations and transactions over, over the period. <laughs> and that took six weeks to manually go through all of these particular communications and rebuild it. So certainly not, not a, um, a, a smooth ride. Um, the offering um, from 2006 until 2009 sort of remained in this um, groceries and, and, and fuel voucher space. Um, but by 2009, Zimbabwe had dollarized. And so all of a sudden, the US dollar was, was, was accepted tender. Um, and so an opportunity arose to start actually sending cash to do what Makuru does today, our kind of bread and butter, um, which is to remit 
actual cash value um, cross borders in terms of person to person remittances. And so the, the, the product changed into what we really kind of look at today as our, as our DNA, which was actually moving money from the UK and Europe into, um, into our recipient territories in terms of that remittance pro um, a product. At the same time, there was a core tech migration that needed to happen. So what was built in 2005 for sort of a, a online airtime and, and then a little bit of fuel coupons um, by 2009 needed a bit of an upgrade, but also procedural PHP, we've always been the PHP shop, was uh, what, we were, what was built on and the framework needed an update. And so being quite sort of in tech and wanting to move with the times, um, the, the company chose to move onto a, a PHP framework called Kahana, which was brand spanking new at the time. And um, in December of, of, of 2008, um, moving into the beginning of 2009, uh, the migration happened onto this new framework and it simply wouldn't work. And there was absolutely nothing that our guys could get to make it work. And so um, our founder went straight to the source and he flew out the 21 year old who had built this framework and flew him out and put him up in his flat in London for the six weeks that it took for us to actually get our new, our new Kahana framework PHP working in the product environment. So along with that <laughs> also came the challenges of a, a partnership and a, and a technology network in the recipient countries. So remittance always has two legs to the transaction. It's always about how do you get someone to send money um, and that's sort of represented here. And then how do you get someone to receive the necessary technical triggers, et cetera, to allow them to go and actually receive their cash. Um, and as we started getting networks, partner networks on board, remembering that these guys were sitting in London, um, partnerships were created both basically with the financial sector, so with various banks, and what we did is we gave them access to the same online portal, there's obviously limited user access, to enable a voucher lookup so that um, a reference number could be used to actually hand out the cash. So the tech challenges, along with kind of building some new features, ongoing support, was now suddenly about activations not only in the core country where we operated, but in a destination country as well. And that brought with it a lot more challenge in terms of the scope and scale of, of, of things to come. In 2010, um, which is kind of an absolute landmark year for Makuru, uh, the UK company that is Makuru moved into Africa and they partnered with an Adler, a company called InterAfrica. And Adler is an authorized, de uh, authorized dealer with limited authority. Um, and the Adler that we partnered with had a Bureau de Change license, which was required in order to facilitate uh, international money transfer transactions and um, to South African law. So Makuru partnered with, with this Adler into Africa and they formed Makuru um, in terms of a joint venture and, they, and an African company. Um, and they were in South Africa. And this was a massive um, step forward and kind of really what has started to launch the Makuru as we know it in, South Af in Africa today. Because the diaspora movement from Zimbabwe in particular um, into South Africa um, and the migrant sort of labor crossing the border to look for work given the economic meltdown that was happening in the late 2000s meant that there was a really big market here of people needing to send money home and no real way to do that. So a lot of people used the informal market, they would send money on buses, via taxis, they would ask their mum to borrow money from this other person who was traveling down south so a lot of kind of informal management of the need to send money back home. What it meant from a technical perspective and, and, and the challenges that came with that is that the partnership was made with a go in concern and a Bureau de Change company called Inter Africa who had all their own tech. And so what, what was needed from a technical perspective and, and kind of was interesting in the, in the journey of from a Makuru side is that the technology that had just been quite simple and online was suddenly needing to be integrated to access the depth of, of channels, basically branch, the branch network that was available um, through Inter-Africa. And so 
system integration, as well as the new South African legislative framework and all of the, that that meant, was a big piece of our tech puzzle to solve. Um, we're offering a product in a brand new territory, so with that comes new regulations, comes new challenges, etc. And the contact center was moved to South Africa, um, and sort of moved um, out of out of Zimbab out of the UK, um, and and a smaller operation remained in the UK. And one of the reasons why that happened is that what the company discovered is that the who they were dealing with in 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 South Africa, and who our customer really was, was somebody who really wanted to feel like he belonged, um, and and someone had his back. And someone could really, you know, someone he, he could trust in a world where he's left everything to come across a border to try and make a life and earn some money so that he can improve um, his own destiny. Um, and so we realized kind of that it was quite important to start to speak to people in their own languages, which, which was one of the reasons why the call center was moved to Africa. Okay. Um, the branch network that was established and kind of leveraged in this space became absolutely critical. But, and, and mostly because a lot of the, the kind of person, the customer we were accessing and, and who needed this remittance service did not have access to the same technology that the UK customer had access to. So these guys didn't have PCs, they weren't sitting at an office desk. You know, they were taxi drivers, they were waiters, they were kind of working in various different sectors of the market and this offering didn't work. And some of our founders kind of went and sat next to home affairs. A lot of the migrant um, laborers in South Africa are in fact assignment seekers. And so they went to home affairs and kind of set up with their scanner and all these things outside home affairs, trying to just share the, share the word and attract some customers who are coming in and out. And they thought, well, this is absolutely ridiculous. We are not meeting our customers where they are and we don't have tech that really works for them. And so by 2012, that had all changed. Um, and the crew had really moved into the advent of the core of what our tech offering is today, which is really around an agent model, um, a very user-friendly and, and easily accessible free self-service model in the form of USSD and .mobi. Um, and we'd already we'd started to understand that Zimbabweans were not the only people in South Africa who needed this service. So a key game changer for Makuru and the tech that drove that was something we call our agent army. And essentially what we've done is we built an Android app that we can put into people's hands and people can go out and find customers where they are. They can go into the communities um, and, and actually sign up customers where they are. Uh, we've always taken the view that compliance can be an enabler to business and doesn't have to be a disabler and kind of a blocker in terms of customer service. So making sure we could be compliant in terms of capturing customers' documents, capturing their addresses because we could physically go and visit them and then sign an affidavit saying, I've seen where this customer lives, he, he lives right here. Um, as well as, as, as utilizing and, and having the ability to look at, foreign, at, at passports, asylum papers, et cetera, as a form of KYC was something that our head of compliance actually spearheaded with the Reserve Bank to say, you know, we, we have this need. We don't want these transactions going underground. We want to, to move people along a journey towards a financial inclusion. But that means that we do need some sort of dispensation in what were then quite rigid KYC rules for all financial services. Um, and so, so we worked on that. And the other element that really changed the game was not making the entire transaction happen in one space, i.e. a branch where you walk in, register, create the transaction and pay for it. But in splitting that up by leveraging the retail network. So what we've done and, and what it has really been an amazing game changer for us is allow customers to go onto a USSD platform for free, um, really important for our customer base, create an order, get texted um, and, and a reference number, and then take that SMS reference number into a retail partner and be able to put their cash over the counter in a retail environment. And one of the first partners to sign on was PEP. Um, and so we were suddenly technically in the world of splitting a transaction that had always happened in a one-stop shop into its component parts, 
um, to putting up new channels like USSD and DocMobi so that our, our market could access them. And in the integrations world of, of kind of getting our retail partners to be able to take cash over the counter for us and, and, and the relevant recons that come with that. As we grew in the space, we were also in the world of needing more stability and more security in our systems landscape. And so we moved into AWS hosting. Previously, we'd kind of been hosting in a physical server in, in our offices in Cape Town. Um, and so we moved into that, into that space. And as well, at the same time, you know, it's never been dull at Makuru. It's always been incredibly busy. We were busy turning on the various partners that were enabling a Malawian offering. Um, by 2015, we'd added a customer app to this sort of tech stack, and it's really become the core of what we do um, at, at Makuru, kind of a branch offering, an agent offering, self-help channels that allow a customer to create an order and a retail outlet that lets you go and put that cash down. Because we realized so many of our customers, and even today, so many of our customers are not banked and cannot be banked. And so one of the reasons that we moved into an additional product offering is because of exactly that. So by 2015, Makuru had launched what we call the Makuru card, which is a simplified bank account. It's backed by a standard bank. Um, and that Makuru card suddenly gave electronic financial access to customers who were otherwise barred from financial services in our country. Um, and that essentially meant that they could get their salaries paid into their card, they could start shopping electronically, and they could pay for a remittance to send money home from their card. So they were not bound by making sure a shop was open close to them where they could pay their cash. And, and so we could start to reach customers who were more kind of in, in, in more rural areas, who had different work hours, who found it difficult to go and pay in cash. We also suddenly kind of started um, servicing uh, recipients and transfers from particularly South Africa into Botswana, Kenya, Mozambique, Lesotho, and Zambia. Um, and in that process, we realized that there were certain mobile wallets in particular, and sort of the, some of these areas were, were better banked, where we needed to do bank top-ups into these, into these recipient countries, and particularly we needed to integrate with the mobile wallet offerings that were quite, becoming quite prevalent across Africa, as well as have a strong cash offering. And so 2015 kind of is really about us getting new product development going by 2015, managing this new card product in South Africa, as well as dealing with an integrations landscape that hadn't been on the radar before. So the need to integrate with mobile, mobile wallets in order to land um, that value in the destination country electronically, integrate directly with banks for top-ups, um, and integrate with some of the banking partners who had previously been quite happy to log into our portal, but who were now saying we need an electronic offering for recons, et cetera, became really something quite, quite important for us from a technology perspective. And so a lot of focus on how we're gonna build those APIs, et cetera. We also realized, um, you know, as much as we've made plans in our sending territory in South Africa to meet customers where they are through the use of technology like USSD and, and an agent app and putting agents out into the communities, we needed to reach recipients in our destination countries where they are as well. It is absolutely useless to send money into a country nice and cheaply and affordably and then ask your recipient to travel for two hours, spend the corresponding cash on travel to access that money. And so having a really strong payout partner network within our destination countries, is something we were realizing is absolutely critical. And so we kind of went on a partner integration mission to build what we call reach so that we can reach both our senders and our recipients where they are. And it's a really important element of our customer service. Um, by 2017, we were starting to see some really nice sort of traction in our, in our African countries, our technology, our integrations working quite nicely. In South Africa, we have a financial services product for senders who need it. We have some good, the app has come on board. Um, 
and and we have some good re, you know a, a bigger retail partner network partnered with pay at um, which kind of gave us the the reach across the pick and pay shop rights etc um, and so we started turning our, our attention to two things that happened in our in our world um, number one was the fact that yet again Zimbabwe kind of where a lot of our roots are from and, and where, where we service a major sector of our customers are from Zimbabwe um, was once again hitting a cash crisis um, where although the US dollar had been pretty much available since 2019 by 2017 access to those US dollars was starting to dry up and our typical payout partners the banks etc were unable to service our customers they were starting to run out of the actual cash that we needed and so we needed to come up with a, a service offering of our own and within sort of a four to five month period it was a very quick turnaround we put down a network of uh, booths within our Zimbabwe so we call that the Makuru Orange booth and we built a corresponding app that can run on the sniffer von Ulrag under a tree just outside of Victoria Falls um, so that we could put uh, float management and actually pay out the cash necessary and link into this core infrastructure in terms of a cash voucher in the far reaching areas of, of Zimbabwe um, and get our own cash logistics working in order to ensure that we could keep servicing um, our customers. And that the sort of thing that we had to do, uh, which we sort of kind of rushed in and, and thought this is a good idea and, and that we've got to do this to survive. You know, we need to make sure we can keep servicing our customers has really changed the Makuru landscape completely. Because what we've realized is in the Makuru vertical is an important thing for us. So talk about entrenching the Makuru vertical, actually having our own payout presence and our own presence on both the sending and receiving side being something we own as our own brand. So we can own the customer service, we can make sure that the cash flow never runs out and we can really own our own destiny and support our customers better. So 2017 was fundamentally about launching that um, in Zimbabwe and, and therefore changing how we think about um, our destination territories completely. Um, it also kind of was a space where we started doing more and more and more integrations within these African countries and we brought more African countries on board. The DRC, Namibia, Ethiopia, Ghana were now destination countries that you could send to. And, and we started, sort of started seeing some return flows in areas where we started to get our own license. So what we, what we did also between 2015 and 2017 is actually start to get our own licenses in some of these destination countries as financial services providers and, and put down our own branch presence which is usually a license requirement in those countries so that we can start to sort of build the opportunity to look at the flows that move intra-Africa as opposed to just the flows that kind of are moving out of major centers like South Africa. So not only did we bring on board these additional four African countries, we also brought on board Asia. Um, and so we'd worked for quite a while um, sort of it was probably about a two-year project it wasn't an easy integration for us and a lot of learning because it was the first time we had really worked with an aggregator to get access to sort of some of the flows that go into particularly Asia so India Pakistan and Bangladesh and so we went into an aggregator integration space and an aggregator is typically um, sort of a tech platform in the remittances world who have already signed up multiple banks, et cetera, as payout points, and they would go to the, the originators of, of money transfers all over the world and say, you know, integrate with us and we'll give you this kind of these 90 countries of payout reach um, because we've already done that integration for you. And so we particularly went with an aggregator called um, Express Money and another one called Money Trans to enable the payout into Asia and to some of these African countries where we couldn't kind of keep up with our own desire to, to get into these territories. Um, and that Asian play was, was really interesting, a completely different customer needing new, new um, ways of interacting with us, um, you know, who were much more wanting a, a kind of a richer front end. Um, and so changed our thinking yet again in terms of the tech challenges that lie ahead. 
In 2018, it's the year of scale. And from a tech perspective, that has meant so much. So we kind of, we're now starting to send to multiple places. We've got branch networks all over the place. We've got a humming booth network in, in, um, in Zimbabwe. We turned on Nigeria and Cameroon. But effectively what we started doing in 2018 that really changed the game is we started to activate intra-country flows. So previously we, we sort of saw um, remittance flows coming from the UK and Europe into all of these countries and coming from South Africa into these countries. But by 2018, we wanted to turn on the flows that happen naturally across the continent because of diaspora migrant, um, migrant worker movement. And particularly that is um, from Botswana, from places like Zambia, from Zimbabwe, a lot of cross flows, countries that need um, remittance transactions to, to get access to goods and services outside of their country. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of intra flows. And turning this on put our systems under incredible pressure. And so we went through a major system sort of overhaul, I suppose, um, to allow this to happen. We were managing far larger volumes than ever before in terms of the matrix effect of all the flows that move um, between these various countries that can now have some intra-trade. And each, each flow, each financial flow, so a remittance from South Africa to Botswana, we call a remittance corridor. A, another remittance from South Africa to Zimbabwe is a separate remittance corridor. And the matrix of all those corridors meant that the transaction volume just really spiked. But it also meant that we could not any longer sort of tack on just receiving countries onto our architecture. We needed a configurable, properly configurable architecture for remittance corridors, for whether we're sending cash via mobile wallet, via bank account, and other products like paying for international airtime. Uh, you can buy airtime in South Africa for someone in Zimbabwe or Botswana, for example. Um, all the currencies that move along across there. So a lot of African countries will accept the US dollar in terms of the dominations, and we needed to see the full treasury view on the dollars we needed, as well as Kwacha, Malawi and Kwacha, Zambia and Kwacha, the Pula, et cetera. And we're suddenly dealing with multiple legislative frameworks because when you start sending money out of different uh, legislations, you, you're now bound by their reserve bank and ex-con legislation. Um, and we, we absolutely needed a configurable engine to drive all of this. And so as the company hit scale from a tech perspective, we were absolutely ripping apart and rebuilding some of the core to give us that configuration for scale. And so we embarked on a project that we're still busy with in terms of a microservices architecture approach um, to give us better speed, to just allow us to sort of really reuse elements in, in, in our code base that needed to be reused across multiple countries, um, looking at consolidated API designs. So a bespoke API that was built for the first bank that we ever integrated with in Malawi, um, now needed to kind of fit a proper pattern that can work for any integration that comes along at, in our expansion journey. We also moved quite quickly into the infrastructure as code space. So all of this, this stuff, all of these flows has quite a lot of seasonality to it. And we hit particularly very high peak volumes um, over uh, school fees season. So when, when people are sending money home at the start of the school terms in the various countries around uh, religious celebrations like Christmas, Eid, Easter. Um, and so, so we really needed to be able to very quickly scale up and scale down our infrastructure. Um, and we also got into the world of a dedicated monitoring and support capability. So we built an entire team under our kind of tech umbrella to do application support and application monitoring. Whereas before then, we could kind of handle it within our, our dev teams. Um, but, but the scale just, this, this meant that we needed to do a, have a bit of a step change in our tech as well. Okay, so 2019 really um, has been about leveraging our products and, and, and our network and continue to meet our customers where they are and upgrade our core. So in 2019, um, we turned on Tanzania, Uganda and Eswatini. 
we have seen a lot more traction in terms of um, flows originating in some of these countries. So for example, Malawi, um, there's, quite a, there's quite a big trade in terms of Malawi and uh, money going from Malawi into South Africa and to Zimbabwe, which has been interesting to see. Um, and we continue with our process of sort of upgrading our tech and, and, and allowing us to get into a scalable world where we can start leveraging the incredible network that we have built up over the last 10 years within Africa. We launched WhatsApp. Uh, we were one of the first companies to launch business WhatsApp in South Africa, and it's now across all of our, our territories from which we send. Um, and it now accounts for 25% of our transactions. So that's had amazing traction. Um, and so it's a, it's a great channel because although USSD is free, it's a very limited channel. It's quite hard to kind of see where you've been because you can't see your history of the conversation you've just been having in a USSD. Whereas you can in WhatsApp, we can send rich pamphlet data, we can enable WhatsApp chat so that we can actually help our customers on the channel that they're transacting with now and not having to kind of create a disconnect in a, in a contact center. We also started to rewrite this app. Our app is, is pretty old, this agent app over here, um, and it has served us so well um, since sort of, I think about 2013 is when we first launched it, but properly um, at scale from, from 2015 onwards. Um, and Android is, has moved so fast and the whole mobile world has moved so fast um, that we're quite excited to be upgrading this tech. And the first version of that went out and will continue to roll out throughout this year. Um, Information security is obviously a big focus for us, and, and in 2019 was, was something that, was, that has always been important, but got a lot, of, a lot more focus. And, and system performance at peak periods, in December of 2019, we were doing three transactions a second um, on a stack that some of which was built to deal with 4,000 transactions a month. Um, so, so that journey has been, has been particularly interesting. And we're in the world of, of, of a really strong, solid fintech brand with loyal customers who've been with us for years um, and getting into an automated space to reward those customers for their behavior has also been um, an interesting journey within 2019. So who are we today? And kind of what does Macru look like today from the early days of 2005 and manually rebuilding databases to kind of who, Macru is today and, and, and how we how the technology supports that. You know, our footprint, we're we're in 20 African countries and also having a presence in the UK and the EU means that we, we, we cover a lot of these destinations. Um, we have 60 partnerships worldwide that enable over a hundred major brands as pay in and pay out points, either in cash or electronically through mobiles, mobile wallets or, or bank accounts um, across the globe. Uh, this as I mentioned, our, our foray into this orange booth world has absolutely changed how we can service our customers um, in Africa. So we have 200 booths across Southern Africa, in um, a lot of them in Zimbabwe. We put down a whole bunch of booths um, in Malawi at the beginning of 2019. And recently this year, you know, I think about 30 booths have gone into Zambia with plans this year to roll out um, an, an even bigger booth infrastructure. We have licenses in all the countries where we have branches. So Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Malawi, Mozambique, Uganda, the DRC, Kenya, Lesotho, Eswatini, um, which means that we have the opportunity to send from these countries as well and really create more of that intra-African matrix of remittances. I say good branch network within South Africa. And our Makuru card product and the, the wallet that lies behind it um, is something that is really starting to, to show incredible value to our customers in South Africa, particularly now in an area like in a world with lockdown and COVID-19 and, you know, the, the ability to actually have access to electronic products for a lot of customers who, who've never wanted to really step into that electronic space. We're seeing a bit of a step change there and we have well over 100,000 active cards um, at the moment. In terms of some of the key technology that we've looked at launching um, you know, this year, so between April and June, and particularly in response to COVID and, and the lockdown space, um, a, a deal that has been in, in the making for quite a while and, and was announced in April 
was Makuru's purchase of the Zona technology and assets in Malawi. Uh, Zona kind of broke the booth model on um, booths in Malawi and have been a very, very strong payout partner for us in that territory. And Malawi is a big, big um, part of our customer base and our transaction flow. Um, and so when an opportunity came up, Zona's kind of moving more into an enterprise world. And when the opportunity came up for, for us to purchase these booths um, and kind of secure the incredible rural reach that that brings in a country like Malawi, uh, it was a really good, good um, decision for us. And so we've, that deal went live um, in April. Um, we also have uh, previously, many years ago, we used to remit RAND as well as US dollar into Zimbabwe. Um, that was turned off for a while whilst the Zim dollar, I mean, whilst the US dollar was, was kind of became the key currency. And then when the Zim dollar came back on board, there was some traction, you know, there was, there was some um, US dollar exchange rate things going on. Um, and now we've relaunched RAND so we can remit RAND back into, into Zim which is very, very useful when you are trying to buy your goods and services in RAND because there's a food supply within your country. Um, and so that product has really gone off. We've also launched the ability for customers to sign up directly on USSD and WhatsApp um, in, a, in a time when we can't send our agents, or we couldn't during level five and level four lock, lockdown, we couldn't send our agents out into communities anymore to help people sign up for our services. And so we've launched um, an opportunity for customers to do that themselves. Um, and I think it's going to change, you know, this, this, this lockdown has sort of fast-tracked a lot of people into a more electronic world. Uh, we've launched something called Makuru Groceries, which is a, allows a customer to send cash back into Zimbabwe that is dedicated to buy a, de a, a particular basket of groceries. We've done some business to, we've done some business um, bulk, disbursement type work with Doctors Without Borders who have needed to get cash to multiple people um, in Zimbabwe um, and have come through our services. And we have just turned on uh, a remittance flow into China. So our challenges kind of remain um, enabling new products which, existing our, which leverage our existing tech as well as our footprint, managing the tech that we've acquired through, through recent acquisitions, we are busy rewriting our systems into um, kind of microservices, adding new apps, upgrading things, whilst operating at scale. Um, and our biggest challenge is the time to do all the incredible things we want to do. Um, you know, the, the future I think is exciting. Uh, we want to be the answer for moving money into within and out of Africa, and we have the footprint to do that. So how we leverage that footprint for additional services is an exceptionally great tech challenge. We want to move customers along a financial journey into a digitized sort of wallet world. Um, a lot of, we, we've started that journey in South Africa with our Macru card product, and certainly there's a lot of discussion about digitization in Africa. Um, we, we need to launch products and services which cater for a banked market. So with the lockdown, for example, we have had a whole bunch of customers knocking on our door who usually would use the banking sector to move money. Um, across Africa and suddenly they can't do that and they're looking to use remittances, which means we want to relaunch things like our customer app um, and, and really help you know, expand our customer base into, into a world of, of a completely electronic um, and financially served customer, which hasn't been our, our market to date, as well as um, support enterprises who, who need to disperse value in bulk, be that cash or electronically, because we have the footprint to do so. Alrighty, I'm going to stop there. Um, um, Sarah, perhaps we can see if we've got some questions. That was such an interesting journey. I mean, going from, I mean, my heart sank for the, you know, the six weeks of data, re, you know, having to rebuild that database. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I think that's every, every human being's worst nightmare, isn't it? Having like, Absolute nightmare. But, but that amount of work. And, you know, and then, then I love the idea of like, she, you know, like, well, we want to use this code. Let's just fly the guy who wrote it here and sit with us, you know. <laughs> it's amazing how down and dirty you need to get at the beginning of these things, right? Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm sure there are some, 
fintechs who've had the perfect journey and they've hit across something and it's been slick and sexy and they've sold it and you know but i don't think that's the typical story i think the typical story is one of grit and a little bit of failure and quite a lot of time before you find exactly what it is that your market needs and you've worked out how that product and tech really works for them and i'm super grateful that you are you know that mccrew and you are willing to share that with us because i think you know we often gloss over the challenges and the difficulties and how long it can take and and you know at times how soul destroying i would imagine you know i mean sitting there for six weeks fixing that must have been horrific but it is a, it is a it is a journey like you said that needs grit and it needs you know it, it doesn't happen overnight and looking from you know you said 2005 to achieving scale in 2018 you know you've got to keep focused and keep on it and keep motivated throughout that time right no absolutely and i think I think the level of energy, our, we have amazing founders, just such incredible guys. And, and the level of energy and how they provide energy for each other and kind of feed off, it, it's a wonderful thing to watch because I think on your own as well, my word, it, it must be so very, very difficult. Um, and we still have that sort of, it, it might not all go so well, but we can deal with that. You know, we can kind of roll with those punches. And if you're going to be, big in Africa, you, you do need to have that kind of attitude and be able to roll with those punches. Um, our biggest market, Zimbabwe at the time, the cash was just about to dry up. You know, we couldn't let that happen. And so quite an, quite an awesome innovation came out of that that's really changed the game and we wouldn't have seen that coming. Um, but, but having that grit, I think, has really helped. And it also struck me that the, your journey has changed over time because of economic situations, because of crises like, you know, we're having at the moment with coronavirus. You, it's that you can't ever reach a point where you're done. It's constant change. Right? It's constant change. And I mean, we've, we've wanted to do um, self sign up for our customers for a while. And um, it's always been, not the, it's been the plan, kind of some of the work had done. Nothing galvanized action like this. You know, we had to get that out within the first three to four weeks of this lockdown to help our customers. Um, and I was looking at our, our numbers that it's actually that feature has, is half our signups in May in South wow. Africa. So it's so really interesting that there's a massive need there and you need to respond to it and you need to do that quickly. And I'm getting such a sense from, from you. And also, you know, one of the reasons this, this webinar came around because I, you know, I met one of your founders and, and he was speaking as well. But what, what really strikes me is this business was set up to meet people's needs, to genuinely help people. It wasn't set up to make one person a heck of a lot of money. It was actually set up to be customer focused, meet customer needs and help people along a journey to become more financially included. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, I think, Nothing brought that home more to our Zimbabwean founder sitting in the UK, unable to talk to his mum. It's like, this is just not acceptable. <laughs> and yeah. then unable to let his mum get fuel. And then, you know, the cash. So all of these kind of things, you know, so many of our staff, because we, we, we employ, particularly in our contact centre, people who speak um, the languages, um, a lot of our staff use our services. There is a real need there. Um, and it's, it's, it's great to see technology meeting that need and helping someone move into a trusted space that puts them on the start to financial, to financial inclusion. Well, I can hear from you and, and from the way you talk about the company, there's such a passion and drive there. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really obvious to see that, um, which is great. And I'm gonna pop over, cause I know I've asked my questions now, so I'm gonna <laughs> pop over to the Q and A function and let's hear from some of the people joined us today. We've got quite a lot of questions coming in. Um, so I'll start with a question um, from Naeem. Um, how is the Makuru card backed? Um, so, so we have a banking partner in, in Standard Bank, so it's RAND. I mean, it, it's not a, a, a sort of, sort of a, a representation of value. It, it's a RAND-based product um, and it's backed by Standard Bank. Um, and so, yeah, we have a payroll function. Lots of people get paid onto their card. Um, it is a, it's a visa card. And so you can go and swipe, withdraw at ATMs. Um, it's a, it's a simplified bank account product. Um, yeah, works as such. 
And so it's a nice step for those who've never been banked to, to take, but, you know, before going to maybe a big, a bigger, well-known bank that seems quite scary. Absolutely. And it also, it's, it fills a very real need for our customers. So if you have arrived in the country and you've just started a job and your employer says to you, I have to pay you into a bank account, but no bank will open a bank account for you. This is very tricky. Um, and so the Makuru card product really can fill that, that gap. And the likelihood is that some of the money you earn, you want to send home. And so, you know, it just becomes easier, cheaper, et cetera, to do that from your, from your electronic funds. And Terrero has asked a couple of questions, um, but I'm going to pick um, one in particular. Um, so were there, were there very difficult challenges and, and the different, between different countries in terms of the regulation? So, you know, I'm sure some countries were more challenging than others. What, what are some of the Yeah, so, so, so it's, you know, the, the whole African landscape has been very challenging. So from, from kind of getting our licenses in, in certain areas, those regulations can be quite interesting and quite, quite tricky to, to uh, get, you know, in Mozambique at the moment, we're working with the government in, in, a, in a bit of a sandbox um, scenario because they actually don't have legislation for companies like us. So that was, that's been very, very interesting. Um, but, but more than that also has just been kind of the level of integrations that we need to do. I mean, we are integrating sometimes 20, 25 different African wallets or banks, et cetera, a, a year. And those are sometimes very challenging, kind of the, the, the technology available, how we work with that, um, you know, the, the idea of speed, all, all of those things um, can, be, can be quite um, quite a challenge. So yes, it's a lot of spending time walking the path flying in when you're allowed to fly, um, <laughs> so <sitting down laughs> people face to face um, and, and really working it out, you know. I think business is about relationships and there is a lot of that. And I mean, I was very impressed by the, the way you approach the, the partnerships, you know, it, it's often the, the collaboration and, you know, the, the joining with other organizations is often seen as being something taking away from, from you, but actually you've done the opposite. You've embraced that you can't reach everybody. So you have to have partners. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, our partnership, you know, our, our partner network is absolutely our strategy and has been a major enabler for us. So in talk, talking of partnerships, we have a question from Kevin and I know Kevin from, from Bank of Kigali in Rwanda and he wants to know when are you coming to Rwanda? So maybe there's a potential partner for you there. <laughs> Absolutely. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> um, we, are, we are working, we are currently trying very hard to get our license in Rwanda um, and, and have been working um, with that. So, so yeah, as soon as we can get some, some partnerships um, and or a license going in Rwanda, we would love to do so. Um, so yeah, it's, it's on the radar. Great. Well, maybe I can connect you with Kevin afterwards. <laughs> um, and another, another really good question um, from Peter here. Um, so with lockdown limiting the ability of the use of agents, um, has it made you reconsider using them going forwards or um, you know, are they still gonna play a really important role for you? And was there a way of trying to support the agents themselves through the, the coronavirus situation? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's been, it's been a, a, a big concern of ours that our staff have been supported through, um, you know, through this, this <laughs> tough time. Um, I, we're, not, we're not looking to, to change our agent strategy at all. Um, we believe that that, that business is about relationships and our agents have incredible relationships within their communities, they're part of their communities. Um, and that is a, a very strong part of who we are. It's kind of meeting customers where they are. So we don't, we don't want to take away our agent model. That's, that's not something we looked at at all. But we are looking to see how our agents can, can service customers better rather than just kind of create a sign up opportunity. So information centers and service centers are, are opening again now in, in um, in level three, Makuru has always been an essential service, so we haven't closed, but we have made the choice during level five and four not to have a lot of people on the streets. So um, they are opening up again now under, under level three, and customers need that support. They need a face of Makuru, and so that is certainly not a strategy we're, we're going to be changing, but we are looking to leverage that great community of, of agents to support customers in other ways. Perfect. Um, and we have a lovely question or two questions actually from, from Jessica. Um, firstly, is your branding the same in Asian countries? 
And also, can you tell us a bit more about how you're doing remote onboarding um, and meeting KYC requirements? Sure. So the branding um, is the same in, in, in Asian countries. So the Makuru brand is, is the same globally. Um, in terms of remote onboarding, so we have worked with a company called Finmark Trust, who works with governments across Africa, particularly in terms of financial inclusion, to look at the new risk-based approach to um, KYC legislation. Um, and so we are looking at, in terms of onboarding, we're looking at where our risk um, lies to allow for uh, a customer to do something like self sign up. And so in the sign up process, we ask a customer to capture all of their data and then we phone them back to validate that they are, they are who they are. And, and we would then be able to get documentation sent through via other channels. Um, but we are also looking to launch channels where documents can be captured in in the actual sign up process, I forgot to mention that biometric tech is certainly on the radar um, for this year and next in terms of sort of the proof of life SDKs you can get in, 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 in apps these days, kind of film a customer winking and doing whatever they do to kind of prove that they are themselves and look at documentation, photographs and actual imagery from that video and, and match that and do online um, sort of KYC verification so we are looking at a lot of that a lot of that tech. fantastic that sounds really interesting and chris is asking are you going to try and launch your makuru card um, around in other countries or will it just be something for south africa so certainly i think there is a move across africa to digitize and we'd want to be part of that so watch the space <laughs> And um, what about, uh, there was a lovely question as well, that could the concept of, of cryptocurrency, um, have you guys um, looked at that aspect of blockchain and crypto from Roland? Um, so our founders in particular um, are very interested in, in crypto um, and we do, we do actually, I'm not sure of all the details, but we do actually work with some crypto models um, in, in Nigeria. So, so yes, I think it is something that, that is on the radar. Um, you know, it's so, it's tempting to get involved in that, in that sort of thing um, off the bat. It's, it's very interesting. It's, it's amazing tech. We need to time it in terms of when it's useful for our market, as well as, as, as kind of, you know, when, because of the, the cool factor right there. So I've got a, one of our directors is desperate to get involved in this thing. Um, but I think we, I think, just in terms of how much we need to do, um, it, it will probably be a little bit further out in our roadmap. And Tatenda's asking, what would you say is the next big, big thing in the remittance space in Africa coming? I do think that digitization is, 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 a, is the next kind of big thing. A lot of, we've been, we've been chatting to, to organizations who are looking to get aid into Africa, particularly during COVID-19, et cetera, and we have an incredible footprint so, so we're interested in those kind of conversations, and and the the general discussion is around digitization. You know, how do we how do we make sure that whatever inflows coming in are going to the person they are destined for directly, um, and not through sort of other organisations where where you kind of lose value along the way. So I think I think that's interesting. Um, I also think that how how mobile wallets start to become interoperable. And, and what that means in, in a remittance space is, is going to become quite, quite interesting, um, particularly in, in certain areas. So, for example, in East Africa, there's a lot of flows already um, through, through their mobile networks. Um, and I think we're going to see more of that happening in the various regions. And that connects really lovely, nicely to a question from Lena, who was, um, you know, his, her question is around Zimbabwe integrating mobile money into their national switch. And I know they're not the only country looking at that. Um, will this impact how you would work in a, in a country or does it make things easier for you? So our DNA is cash. And I do think that a lot of African countries still want cash, but we're already integrating it into most of the mobile players um, within, you know, within certainly in SADC. Um, and what, what, what we see though, is that there's not a lot of transactional flow through those yet because the market is still quite cash bound there. 
people want cash, mm -hmm. um, particularly in, in economies that are struggling. You know, cash is king. So, so yeah, I think it's a good opportunity and we will certainly be, be ready to kind of um, be part of that when it comes. Um, so yeah, I think, it'll, I think it'll open different doors and it'll be an interesting opportunity. And connecting back through to that cash, so Brian's asked a question is, you know, how do you help manage the liquidity of the agents um, so that cashing out, they don't run, run out of cash? So yeah, when we launched our booths, we, we actually launched an entirely new capability within the business, which is cash, cash CIT management and, and, and cash management. Um, so there is an entire logistics chain. We have an entire office that looks at exactly this. <laughs> and they look at the cash liquidity of that and schedule, schedule what needs to happen to make sure that people have cash. You know, we partner with, with banks and, and have a whole series of steps, checks and balances to, to make sure that our tenors have float in the morning and can cash up at the end of the day. And, and how do people sign up to become an agent with you? Um, they can actually contact our call centre um, and ask to sign up to be an agent and, and um, the contact centre will put that person in touch with our kind of head of agents who, who will get in touch. Um, but yeah, a lot of agents actually are customers who have then said, I'd love to work for you guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so there is a process there. Um, and and we, do, we do love that kind of community driven um, sign up. Approach That's great. So going from, from just like, like someone uh, helping someone like maybe cash, you know, send some money or, or get or receive some money suddenly now becomes part of your family, which is a really lovely story. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, and <laughs> you can imagine if, if you find someone who is in their community needing this service, who then says, I'll go and tell my friends. <laughs> it's a partnership that really does work. <laughs> It's, it's testament to how useful people find the service. I mean, it's quite scary, I would imagine. I, I've, I've luckily been banked for most of my life, so it's not so scary for me. But for the first time that you want to send money to a relative in another country, trusting that it's actually going to go there, must be a huge leap of faith for many people. It's a huge, it's a very, very big deal. And so building trust in your processes, your systems and your technology has been the most important thing that Makuru has managed to do. Um, you know, also put yourself, I don't know if any of you have ever been through the UK airport as someone who's visiting the country. <laughs> you feel like a criminal. Now imagine that happens to somebody who's come into our country and they feel like that a lot um, in a South African context. Perhaps every single time they have to go and renew their documents at home affairs, every time they cross the border. Um, this idea of someone actually getting it and for you to trust that this incredible sacrifice you have made is going to end up in the right hands is just huge. So it's really important that you make people feel safe. Yeah. The local language that you talked about having agents and developing just a, a genuine relationship with your customer really makes things so key. Yeah, and, and making sure that technology is is useful for our customers and not scary and frightening and just another reason not to go there um, has also been very important for us. We work so hard on exactly what our USSD menu structure should say, where, what the order should be. If we, change, if we change what number one is, there is a massive fallout there. Mm -hmm. for customers who have kind of memory or who are not very literate and who have been taught the numbers. So there is a, there's a whole play there that we have to think about. Um, when, we, when we're doing technology changes. And we're over the time, so I just want to ask you one last question to wrap up the session. So if you had some advice to give to someone who is in a similar, maybe back in, where you were in 2005, uh, what piece of advice would you give them? I think you need to find a product that people really need. Um, I, think, I think that's key because it will give you the momentum to be gritty enough to see through the tough times because they, they will be there. Um, but knowing that, that you have something that people really need, I think gives the impetus to keep trying when your database goes down and your PHP framework won't build and, and the various other things um, that happen along the way. Thank you so much, Sandy, for sharing the, the hour with us today. We really appreciate it. It's, it's so nice to hear people that have gone on that journey, that the good, the bad, the successes, 
um, it's nice to, to it's, it's inspirational for us to know that if any of us are thinking of starting up something that we can get it to scale. It may be a, a, at times a painful process, but it's also an incredibly rewarding process as well. Incredibly right? rewarding. Yeah. And, and a lot of fun along the way. I think, I think if, remember to have some fun with it. If it's all just, just desperately judgy, I don't, don't think it's going to work. <laughs> And, and I get that sense, like when you watch the, the Makuru videos and you speak to the team, they really enjoy what they do. And, you know, coming to work every day or, or working from home, every, coming to your computer to work every day um, is so important to, to drive that the company values and, and the direction that you go in. Obviously, you've, you've got a good team at Makuru, so that's fantastic. Yeah, well, we think so. Thanks so much for having me, Sarah. Thank you and thank you to all the attendees as well that joined us today and we'll be sharing a recording with you all tomorrow. Have a wonderful afternoon, evening everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye.